Mm. Hello, everybody. How's everybody doing? You ready for another lesson today? I hope so. This will be the first lesson after the midterm. Okay. So this will be scheduled for 2.14.22. Do you happen to know what 2.14.22 is? It's Valentine's Day. So uh, everybody has to be kind to each other and give each other chocolates, and things like that, okay? So that's what this uh, week six is for, February the 14th. So uh, let's get back and learn about some international organizations today, all right? So, to the material. All right, minimize myself. Been nice looking at you. It's done. Okay. Where is my start from the beginning? Hmm. Anything wrong with my computer today? I so I'm just trying to find my exact start from the beginning. I don't want the new slideshow, so. Okay, there it is. Okay. I went too fast again, trying to do everything at one time. So again, Introduction to International Relations. That's the name of our class in case you forgot. Week six, again, scheduled for 2.14.22, which will be Valentine's Day. So if you don't have a Valentine, I hope you can get one on that day. All right. All right. So international organizations, as you have may picked up in the previous chapter, we live in a world of laws. While sovereign states, those are states which can make their own taxes, protect their borders, have their emblem. Uh, they are the principal legal actors. Again, we're using the term from the first week about uh, international relations, green about actors on a state. Uh, international organizations are increasingly important in helping us govern our world. Today's international system is made up of a cacophony of different voices and interests. Uh, don't worry about the word cacophony. It's a word most people, uh, even uh, people born in this country don't even use. It's very rare. Someone usually tries to use it in literature like here. Be uh, more rare for someone to use it in a conversation. But uh, they just want to sound smart, you know, ah, cacophony, you know, it's like, it just use the word variety, right? So it's made up of a variety of different voices and interests. In addition to states, there are non-governmental organizations, multinational corporations, and hybrid, remember hybrid like the, the car, it runs on gas and electricity, two different things. So a hybrid organization, which are a mix of all of the different categories, okay? So it says here, imagine stepping off a plane into a foreign country. As you disembark, which means leave, you switch on your phone to check the messages that may have come through while you were in transit flight. You follow the sign that directs you to the airport's exit, clear immigration, and then pick up your luggage at the designated carousel. That's where your packages go around in a circle. You then head straight for the nothing to declare green lane to the airport. Those routine actions would have already brought you into contact with at least four different international organizations. 
The aircraft that you arrived in would have been one of the many planes under the International Air Transport Association, IATA, and regulated by standards set by the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, that you were able to use your phone to check messages would have been courtesy of the work of the International Telecommunication Union, ITU. And your customs clearance would have been facilitated by the Kyoto Convention, said by the World Customs Organization, WCO, to simplify the customs process. Lucky for you, you don't have to remember the names of these individual organizations. I will not ask you any of them. Okay, just the broad categories that they might fall into. So if you like that, like I said, send your donations, 10,000 or more. Uh, to my email. All right, so finishing off this page, uh, these are just some of the ways in which international organizations form an integral or central part of our everyday lives. Whether these organizations are working to build houses for the impoverished, which means poor, like UN Habitat does, or working to ensure a standard of health for everyone like the World Health Organization, WHO, who most people know about who does. There is no running away from the international organizations. Today, it is increasingly difficult to imagine an international system in which the only voices that matter are those of states. So remember that it's increasingly difficult to imagine an international system in which the only voices that matter are those of states. So if you remember in the first part of this quarter, the big center part of international was always the states. And now it's leaning to another direction. They can't escape it. Okay. Um, so I have a question there. So let me go to the whiteboard. Question of the day. Okay, I'm gonna to try to stretch this to a onesie. One more, be patient. All right. Oh, I need some room here. These are together. All right. Oh, now it jumped. Bad boy. There we go. Okay, name three types of international organizations. So again, pay attention, please. Because these kind of things can come on your test. Oopsie. Okay. <laughs> Three types. So I told you on that list of all the Kyoto this and transit, you don't have to remember those. Give me the three broad levels of organizations that all that list I gave you, they fall under those. Okay. So there's only three. So go ahead, take your time. I hope everybody's buying chocolate for everybody for Valentine's Day.
Okay, you're getting those three down. Again, don't worry about all the ones from the flight association. This convention, no, just give me the broad types of corporations or organizations, right? A big hint for you. Okay, I think you got that now. All right, go to the eraser. And repeating, name three types of international organization. Ipso facto. Okay. Let's go back to the material. All right, so we ended up here when I talked about who, who did it, right? Who done it? Now here we go into international governmental organization. Let me just mark off that I asked you the first question of the day. Make sure that's done. Okay. An international governmental organization or IGO also referred to as an intergovernmental organization is an organization with a membership of only State. Don't forget that only state. We're not talking about a hybrid here. Okay. The organization is usually founded upon a treaty. Treaty is almost like a contract or a multilateral agreement, which means a, uh, an agreement between two or more groups and consists of more than two states. So could be three, could be four, could be 20. Member states determine the way in which the organization is run or governed. They vote within the organization and they provide its funding or monetary uh, needs. Established in 1945, following the end of the Second World War, the United Nations, UN, is a prime example of an international governmental organization with almost universal membership. Only states can be members of the United Nations. Membership is valued because it confers or gives upon the member state international recognition of its sovereignty. So, Again, if you have a country that's not sovereign, which all countries are sovereign, you know, they have their own laws, they can protect their borders, they can have all the images that state who they are, like their flag. As of 2017, there are 193 UN member states, but it is important to note that a small number of states are not members. Taiwan, for example, has repeatedly requested membership, but has had its request blocked by China. Oh dear. This is because China regards Taiwan as a part of its sovereign territory. This is China's claim, regards, right? And does not recognize it as an independent nation. Taiwan, of course, wants United Nations membership because this will mean that the international community fully accepts its sovereignty. The Taiwan example has gone unresolved, unfixed for decades due to the major role that China plays within the United Nations as one of its most powerful members. Okay. All right. So now we're at the end of this page. So I have a few questions for you. Get that pencil. Or young Kil Cho grabs the pencil. Question two.
Okay. An IGO is founded on what? I'm already using the acronym or the letters because this was discussed well uh, by me. We're just trying to get used to the few ones that we'll use. So founded on, you know, what's it founded on? What are the documents that it's founded on? Right? What are the contracts? Right? But go ahead. Try that. Might be a couple of things. I'll give you another hint. Uh, I will at least need two things from you, okay? That you have to tell me, okay? You think you're doing good on that? Again, you're not confused with the acronym, IGO. You know what that is. International Guacamole Organization, right? Am I trying to trick you? No, of course not. I would never do that. You guys trust me already. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next question. It should make it even easy for you to get the number two correct. I'm get a IGO because the sound grammar rules. Okay, so give an example of an IGO. There's one they talked about extensively in the reading, a big one, handles things worldwide. That should be easy. So write that down. Don't say, is it McDonald's? Because they're all over the world. So it's either McDonald's or uh, Domino's. No, I don't think so. Doing okay on those two? If you didn't do the first one correctly now, with the answer to three, you can go back and do two.
Okay, you got those? All right. You get the eraser. Where'd you go, eraser? There you are. Okay, repeating an IGO is founded on what? Tell me the document. Three, give me an example of an IGO. Give me that big organization all over the world. It's not McDonald's. Right? You mark down that I asked you this good question. And let's go back to the material. Where are you, material? There we go. All right. So we ended down here talking about Taiwan and China and being one of the most powerful in the United Nations. Here we go. Continuing. There are six main organs of the United Nations. Once a state is a member, it is automatically, don't forget that, automatically a member of the General Assembly. This is the most democratic organ, which each state gets one vote, no matter how big or small, rich or poor the country. So let's say a big country like China, compared to a tiny country like El Salvador, they get the same amount of votes. One. It's also the place where every September world leaders give their address to the international community. From behind a dark green podium, podium is the thing that uh, teachers get up and talk behind, or people give speeches standing behind that tall wooden uh, podium. And with the UN crest or emblem, clearly visible on that podium so people will know. Uh, obviously, people don't need to know who are there in person, but if you see it uh, by video or TV, you'll know. Where is that guy talking from? Oh, there's the United uh, Nations uh, crest. The other organs are the Security Council, the Economic and Social Council. How about that to remember? E-C-O-S-O-C. -O -O I won't ask you that. Don't worry. Don't forget those donations. Uh, the Trusteeship Council, the Secretariat, not the racehorse, and the International Court of Justice. By far the most powerful organ is the Security Council, which has 15 members, five states, China, France, Russia, the United Kingdom, and the United States are permanent members of the Security Council. The other 10 are voted in by General Assembly for two-year tenure or two-year limits. Security Council is the only organ that can impose sanctions on states or deploy, which means send off military forces on behalf of the international community to keep the peace in a certain area, region, or country. The United Nations itself does not have its own military force, but it can muster or bring up military and police personnel through contributions by its members. These UN peacekeepers are distinguished by their trademark blue helmets, giving rise to the nickname Blue Berets. Okay. So I'm sure you've seen those all over the country is some whatever countries you're from you might have had them in your countries you know so i shall continue this page does not have any questions yay teachers kind okay international non-governmental organization and hybrid they we go to the like the hybrid car have gas have electricity or like some of my male students, they exist on half cigarettes and half alcohol, right? I'm talking about the boys. And hybrid international organization. International non-governmental organizations, INGOs, are non-governmental organizations that either work at the international level or have international members. 
international non-governmental organizations are a mixed bag. So if you never heard the term mixed bag before, it just, uh, it's a funny slang word and uh, it just means a mix of different things. Like someone, you know, in the United States, you want to uh, hear slang Somebody might tell you, if you ask them, hey, uh, I'm thinking about getting married. And is that a good decision? And uh, if your friend is honest with you and likes you, they're going to tell you, well, being married is a mixed bag. It's not all happiness and holding hands and kissing all day even though that's what people would like, you know, it's uh, struggling through different problems and sometimes being angry with each other. And then other parts of the day is holding hands and kissing, and being happy with each other. So this international non-governmental organization, it's a mixed bag, uh, best described is those organizations that are not intergovernmental, business entities or terrorist organizations. There is no exact figure for the number of international non-governmental organizations that are currently active. Nobody knows the exact number. The United States lists over 4,000 with consultative status, which means they can ask questions, but they're not fully members and which may be only a fraction of their two numbers. So a fraction, so what does that mean? There's 24,000 maybe? <sighs> Who knows, correct? Statistics are, have not been kept. All right. And in the bottom of the page, some spectacular and headline-grabbing protests are organized by Surgeon International Non-Governmental. Again, this means they don't belong to a government organization. Images of green, uh, Greenpeace protesters chaining themselves to ships or of anti-globalization protesters blocking streets are usually well covered in the media. So there you go. There's a good example there, Greenpeace. Those are the people that they have a nickname, Save the Whales. So they go where there's whaling ships who are killing whales for different needs, whether oil or what have you. And they go out there and risk their life to try to stop that and save the whales. And they're not run by any government, okay? They're an international non-governmental organization. They both, they're international because they'll go to any sea in the world to stop the whaling, okay? These are the organizations whose mission is to raise awareness amongst the general public, that's us, on issues of concern. They find these issues to be of concern. People who also protest uh, cutting down of uh, trees and the rainforest in Brazil, right? No actual government. That's not the Brazilian government because they're not protesting because they're making a profit. No less effective are those that carry out their missions away from the limelight. So uh, limelight is another slang word. So that means uh, Greenpeace people are usually always in the news. And anti-globalization people are in the news and people who, uh, you know, protest the cutting down of trees or what is called deforestation in Brazil. They're always in the news, but they're saying People that are not less effective that do not get the limelight, and that means be in the news or get the publication. Mercy Corps, which again, most people have never heard of because they're not in the news, helps disaster survivors. So I'll stop there because I do have a question here. On this page. And so. So this will be question four. I make this one as easy peasy lemon squeezy as I can. Okay, 
Describe an IGO. I just talked about it. Go at it. Describe it. That means you're going to have to do more than probably a sentence. Okay. So go ahead. Put as much information on that as you can. Again, reminding the new students that um, this is a practice for the midterm or now final. And people who put more information than someone else get more points. It's that easy. Okay, so go ahead. Think you're doing okay on that one? Continue. Again, uh, students who put more information than less will get a higher, more points and a higher score, obviously. Okay. That's that question for that material. Answers here. So again, describe an IGO. Active material. The reading material, what I mean. Okay, so we were talking about the Mercy Corps, for example, helps disaster survivors in countries around the globe. Medicine Sans Frontier, Doctors Without Borders. I'm sure you've probably heard of that. Is often the first highly skilled responder to a crisis. And Oxfam is at the forefront of various poverty eradication. Eradication means to get rid of things. So poverty eradication programs so attempts to get rid of poverty around the world. Former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan termed groups like these the unsung heroes of the international community. Okay, that's another slang term. You got a lot of slang terms in this chapter, which is good for your English, you know? So unsung hero means a hero that does not get any credit, all right? Uh, Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, they are not unsung because they get a lot of credit. They're very famous, but groups that people, again, not in the limelight, don't get a lot of press, media, but they still do their jobs and they take care of people. 
Um, they're the unsung her heroes, according to UN Secretary Kofi Annan, of the international community. Okay? As long as you know that. It's kind of like, uh, Um, what they say here in the United States that uh, uh, probably the most uh, common on some heroes are your parents. You know, your mother, you know, if you have good parents, uh, mother, like say a mother, she raises you and takes care of you and changes your diaper and feeds you and cleans your runny nose. And what credit does she get? You know, does she get an article in the newspaper talking about what a good job she's done raising you? No, she does. Okay. All right. Now we're going to talk about those hybrids, baby. Hybrid organizations are those international organizations whose membership comprises or consists of both states and civil society members. States may be represented by government departments or agencies, while civil society, as we have seen earlier, can be just about anyone or any organization. One such hybrid international organization is the International Union for the Conservation, which means taking care of, conserving, of nature. IUCN, which deals or works primarily with the preservation of the environment and whose members include government agencies from countries such as Fiji, the large island, and Spain, and non governmental organizations from all corners of the globe. Again, the globe is Earth. Individual members are often experts, right? Like some of my students are experts in ordering the different coffees at uh, Starbucks. And they are affiliated to one of the IUCN's six commissions. The number of hybrid organizations has increased as more and more partnerships are forged or made between states and civil society. So more and more of the states and civil societies are coming together. Okay. Uh, this is now an understanding that hybrid organizations where governments, non-governmental organizations and multinational corporations all have a say or all have power or a vote and can be highly effective because of the reach expertise. So before I get there, I have a question before I continue. And so and this will be question number five. Getting into these describing these descriptions. So, oh, look at that. Weird. I start with a small case and continue with a capital. Very strange. Oops. Strangey. Going on. This computer wants to get tough. Look at that. Okay, we make that one. All right. Oh, added an extra layer there, bad boy. Oh, what did I want to erase all? Shoe be not good. I have to do it over. Let me put a space. Okay, describe that space. Being bad. Bad. Be 
go. Terrible. Giving me a lot of trouble. All right, describe a hybrid organization. So uh, that might be a little tricky. So keep it simple. Keep it simple and you can do this in two sentences, all right? Go at it. simple on this answer, otherwise you're going to be confused how to write the correct information on this, okay? You think you got that? Good deal. Right, sir. Repeating, describe a hybrid organization. There, so we're ending here. Uh, there is now an understanding that hybrid organizations where governments Non-governmental organizations and multinational corporations all have a say and be highly effective because of the reach, expertise, and funding that such groupings can command. See, that's it. It's going to end on a very short note. Now we get into our new topic, new information. All right. All right. How international organizations shape or mold our world. One of the more visible international non-governmental organizations in the world is the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement. Today, the Red Cross is synonymous or means the same, it's the same meaning, with work with victims of humanitarian crises. But before its founding, there was no organization to carry out such work. So before there was not, this did not exist. And no guidelines for humanitarian concerns arising out of war and conflict. So that's like saying they didn't have a way or a map exactly how to do things when they did take uh, shape. In 1862, Swiss businessman Harry Dunant published a book describing the aftermath Right, what comes after, what happened after of the, of the 1859 Battle of Solferino, in which he had experienced firsthand. 
He wrote how the soldiers were left wounded in the field with no medical care, even after the battle had ended. So imagine that before the Red Cross and doctors, physicians are out there helping people wounded. They just left them there lying on the field to die. A long, slow, bloody death. Do not manage to organize the local population into providing assistance to the sick and wounded. Many were moved by his account, which means emotionally moved. And when you're emotionally moved, you usually do something. And in 1863, do not found the International Committee of the Red Cross. You want that to be a question on the mid final? Who founded the International Council of the Red Cross? It was uh, Joe Biden, wasn't it? Because I, I know it wasn't Trump. I hope my students don't say that. Uh, do not's efforts prompted a push to provide for the care of wounded soldiers and civilians caught in places of conflict. Conflict is another word for war. This was the start of the Geneva Convention, which all UN members have since ratified or made legal. The Geneva Conventions form part of the international law that governs humanitarian concerns arising or coming out of war and conflict and stand as a testimony of how an international non-governmental organization, in this case, the Red Cross, can start a movement that later develops into international norms and standards you know, of life. So, um, question here. And make sure you understand your reading and have comprehension. Okay, this will be question six. Stop getting these things together. The space bar doesn't want to work on this uh, laptop. That's not good. That should be together. Look at that. Bad. Let me see if I can fix that. Okay, let me see what I can do on this. Uh, no promises, sorry. A little better. Wow, I, I made a toozy, unbelievable. Okay, name one of the more visible, again, we're talking about, they get the media, people know about them, you and me. So name one of the more visible international non-governmental organizations in the world. Okay. So I think they give you a choice of two. So give me the one that actually people know more about. Okay, so go ahead.
You think you got that? You're like, yeah, I know the organization. It's the uh, Girl Scouts. Yeah, the Girl Scouts, because they sell all those mint, uh, mint chocolate cookies. That's it. Uh, no. Let me go for that eraser. Repeating, name one of the more visible international non-governmental organizations in the world. Is that for an old New York accent? World. Back to the reading. So we ended here, start a movement that later develops into international norms and standards. Okay. States were once the judge, jury, and executioner, the person who kills you, of all matters related to the conduct of international affairs. Remember, we talked about that in the first few uh, weeks. Uh, states were the number one power. Under the guise, or under the veil, or under the sheet of state sovereignty, the state could act with impunity, which means that uh, impunity means there's no consequence for their actions, right? They could do what they wanted and nothing could happen to them. As far as its citizens and lands were concerned, those days are effectively over. They we need so as the pressure of outside interests amplified or volume raised through international non-governmental organizations. They have eroded state impunity eroded you know the word erosion so you can have a building made of concrete but you know after 50 years of rain every year you will see the concrete uh, a lot of it start wearing away the water just beats it down so as it wears away they're saying here they're using it as a metaphor that the state impunity, which again is the ability to do even bad things without anything bad happening to you, it has eroded this kind of power, it's kind of disappearing. And no other area has there been such a major leap, which means jump forward, than in the development of norms involving international human rights. It is also used to. Oh, excuse me. It also used to be the case that monarchs, which means kings, presidents, prime ministers, and other state leaders held immunity from any kind of criminal prosecution while they were in power. How do you like that? Because I'm the king. I know I sent my army and they destroyed your village, but I'm the king, so I'm safe from any type of law or uh, revenge to be held against me. Or actually not remember, but justice. That too has now changed. The International Criminal Court, which sits in the Hague, now has the jurisdiction to hold individuals responsible for a range or variety of crimes. The United Nations briefly discussed the idea of an international criminal court in the 1950s but it took the efforts of a coalition or a group of international non-governmental organizations calling themselves the Coalition for the International Criminal Court to realize the vision of a world court for heinous, heinous are very bad, 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 terrible crimes. In 1997, the coalition eventually managed to garner, which means gain the political will which means the political power to actually do something. And within a few short years, the court had been established. Today, approximately two thirds of the world's states are members, dozens of individuals have been prosecuted in courts of law for war crime, genocide. Genocide is when one group decides to kill all the people belonging to another group and other crimes against humanity. So you know, I, I got a question there, okay? Back to the whiteboard for the question. Okay. 
This is question seven. And then space bar. Okay, let's see what I can do here. Choosies, good. Which organization holds the world's individuals responsible for their crimes? And that means everyone, kings, monarchs, political people. There's an organization that holds them responsible for their crimes. So please write about it. Again, don't give me any funny stuff. Don't tell me, oh, that's the LAPD. No. Oh, it's the FBI. No. Those are police forces. We are looking at an organization that's involved with the courts. You think you're grabbing a hold of that? Shouldn't be too hard. Okay. There's the time. Repeating which organization holds the world's individuals responsible for their crimes? Oh, it's Judge Judy on Channel 5. No. Max material. Okay. That have been prosecuted for war crimes, genocide, and other crimes against humanity. Okay. There are many success stories of how international organizations, once thought to be the tools of states, have come into their own, which means their own power, and set the agenda or the schedule for the international community. Nowhere is this more evident than in the area of environmental preservation. It took the combined efforts of vocal non-governmental organizations and the might of the United Nations to bring states together for a watershed conference on the environment in Rio de Janeiro in 1992, often called the Earth Summit the UN Conference on the Environment and Development was revolutionary because it emphasized the collective responsibility of states 
towards the well-being of the earth due to the earth summit state signed the UN framework convention on climate change the convention on biological diversity and the convention to combat decertification treaties have become important milestones another word for landmark in the fight to save the environment from the harmful practices of mankind. The momentum of the Earth Summit generated still has an impact today as nations continue to work together, albeit often acrimoniously, which means they work together, but they might really dislike each other. But they work together to combat climate change. Okay. So I have two questions here. I think, maybe, am I teasing you? Well, let's get one first and see what I do with the next one. This is question eight. Let me see what I can do here in the stretchy pool. All right, 2Z looks good. Uh, which area, area now, more than others, has set the agenda for international communities? So again, my key is you look for agenda in the rating, you'll find the answer. Okay, so go ahead. Okay, so you might have to write a little bit there. More than one sentence. Okay, you think you got that? Uh, I do have another question in my reading. Sorry about that, but got to give you as much important information as I can.
Okay, question nine. Okay, stretch, try, come on, yay, a onesie, back to the onesies. Okay, what did the Earth Summit, which was talked about on that long page, uh, what did the Earth Summit, uh oh, am I missing a word here? Yes, I am. The biggest word I, I, I need here. Oh, dear. Now this can't be a onesie. Right, yes. Okay, it's going to have to be a twosie. Uh, what did the Earth Summit emphasize uh, collectively? Maybe I can. Back to the stretch. Do I have my English correct finally? What did the Earth Summit emphasize collectively? All together, all they must do. So go ahead and hit that again. That will be more than one sentence, at least two. Start writing. Getting that done? I hope so. All right. You got enough time on that. So let me get the eraser. Repeating on eight, which area? more than others has set the agenda for international community. Nine, what did the Earth Summit emphasize collectively? Okay. You marked down that I wrote questions eight and nine. So you know that means I have maybe one question left and we're at the end of the reading, so we're almost done. So to, to combat climate change. For the average citizen, the most important international organizations uh, might be those whose work can be felt on the ground. The UN Development Program has been a lifeline for many impoverished or again poor nations, helping to raise populations out of absolute poverty. They have nothing. Developing programs to allow the people to be economically sustainable or to take care of themselves and closing the gender equality gap that exists in many developing nations. 
in these cases, instead of states contributing to the organization and keeping it financially afloat, that's the slang word for stable, it is sometimes international governmental organizations such as the World Bank that provide the means for the states to pursue development policies that would otherwise not be possible. However, the results of these assistance programs have been mixed and they are often contentious. We'll just say kind of like temporary at times. Uh, it's a problem. As they have sometimes left countries in significant debt, see that's the problem, or fail to improve their economy. Do I have more here? Where's my thingy? But thing I'm about. Conclusion, yes, this is the end of the reading. Like most other things, international organizations are only as good as the results they yield or give, produce. But there is no denying that they play a central role in international affairs, no denying. Their growth, particularly in the 20th century when the concept of global governance came of age, means that nearly every aspect of life is regulated in some way at the global level. International organizations in their vast array, again, a variety of forms, complement and sometimes positively challenge the role of the state. Going back to the airport analogy used at the start of this chapter, we may not always be aware of how international organizations affect even the most mundane or everyday boring things in our lives, but our lives would be materially different without them. So I have one last question here in this conclusion area. But don't worry about the last page. Final question, we've done the reading, 10. This is pretty straightforward. I can make this a one easily. International organizations challenge what? Again, the keyword challenge, you find that word, you'll get your answer. So go to it. Okay, I think you got that. Again, use challenge to find the answer. Get the eraser. International organizations challenge one. Okay. All right, let me hit the stop share. There I am back. How you doing? So that's it again for the 214 Valentine's Day lesson. Go out and share the love, people. Okay, and we'll get together the following week. Thank you.